Okay, welcome to this live episode of Being Human. Now, if this if this software is working, I believe we're now currently live on LinkedIn and YouTube, which would be a first for the for the show. And it is a delight to have as my guest for this uh, groundbreaking moment, uh, Tad Moy, uh, Tad Mo- Tad Moy uh, Gos Goswami. Um, welcome to the show, and you might be the the world's only sanity correspondent. Is that right? Yes, yes. So, so you're kind of making two histories, uh, going live and talking to the world's first sanity correspondent. Um, so, congratulations, and I'm very, very thrilled to be on the show. Yes, um, and you're, you're you're sanity correspondent for the correspondent, uh, yeah. an online an online publication. Um, yeah. So, tell us a bit about how you wound up being the world's only sanity correspondent for the correspondent. <laughs> Uh, yeah, when you when you put it like that, it 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 does sound all kinds of warped. Um, I can tell you that it wasn't a, it wasn't a straightforward linear journey. Um, this is not something I planned to do when I was uh, 15 years old. Um, but as it happens, I have uh, I I am a two decade veteran of depression um, and anxiety and uh, and all sorts of other mental issues. Um, and I was a business journalist in India. I used to work for some of the largest business publications in India and the world. Um, and then uh, about four years ago, I had a fairly severe relapse of my depression. Um, and that's when, and, and a couple of years after that, uh, we became parents. Um, and then I really started wondering whether this is what I want to do the rest of my life. Um, um, and I wrote a couple of uh, posts about uh, sort of living and working with depression on LinkedIn, which kind of went viral. And I started getting a lot of emails and messages from people in the US, in the UK, of course, in India, um, saying that it had really made a difference to their lives. And, um, you know, it, it got me uh, thinking. Um, and But I knew that writing about mental health isn't something that you can do um, uh, full time because it, it doesn't, there, there is no such job dis- description. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the correspondent, which is uh, the sister publication of Du Correspondent, which is the Dutch um, a version. They've been around for six plus years now. They're very successful, completely member funded, so no pressure from advertisers. And they launched their English edition. And I thought, well, this is a wacky place um, and I can take my chances. So I sent them an application and I was one of the five people they hired from all over the world when they launched. Um, and uh, that's my designation, uh, sanity correspondent. I basically write about mental health um, and and uh, sort of problems of the mind, ways to heal the mind, but as opposed to, um, you know, uh, instead of calling it mental health, which comes with pharmacological sort of undertones, I thought I was more interested in the politics and the economics of mental health, um, having been a business hack. Um, and so I thought, let's call it sanity, which is a lot more uh, insulated, I think, from some of the associations that people tend to automatically draw up when you say mental health. Um, and that's where I am. Um, you know, we launched in September and we are uh, we are having an absolute whale of a time um, putting together this platform for uh, an incredible bunch of members from 140 countries, about 53, 54,000 members. So I'm, I'm super stoked. Right. And that's so that's interesting. So you've you've come at it less from a pharmacological point of view, and more you say from a from a business and politics or economics and politics perspective. What's um, what do you see then as the major sort of factors and drivers in mental health from that perspective? Yeah. So uh, you know, um, like with anything, like with any other um, uh, subject that impacts uh, the sort of wider public, um, unless you make something an election issue unless you make the politicians in your country care about it, you're unlikely to really affect uh, change. Um, and so um, mental health being so intersectional, and this is really um, you know, the, the fascinating thing about mental health is that <clears throat> there is this uh, idea that mental health has just got to do with like serotonin levels in your brain or um, you know, something that went wrong with you in your childhood. Those are sort of the, the cliches or the myths around mental health. But the fact is that mental health is affected by everything from your income to your gender to your sort of broader identity. Um, And of course, the the political climate in which you find yourself, all of that has a bearing on mental health. So uh, one of the 
key principles with which uh, i do my work these days is is the is is the sort of assumption that mental health is intensely political um that it 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 is it has a bearing on your life choices and your life choices in turn have a bearing on it and of course your life choices are the result of i mean they're not they're not always voluntary we make life choices based on uh the cards that we are dealt with um which which is a function of society politics economics all of that so um the idea is very much to write about mental health in a manner that uh is not very is not necessarily meant only for experts psychologists psychiatrists uh mental health professionals but to really establish that mental health is something that concerns everybody on the planet and um unless we are able to make it exciting and relevant uh even for people who don't necessarily have a diagnosed condition um you know and i always give the i think when we were chatting earlier i was talking to you about uh how how cancer became so relevant and and exciting as a as a subject of study um such that if you read a story about cancer anywhere um you are likely to read it if it's well written because and and it you know you don't necessarily have to be a cancer patient or know somebody who has cancer because it has become the sort of it is at the cutting edge of medical technology and and uh people like to know what is happening uh, with cancer research and i thought that that very much should be the goal um with mental health as well it it has to be made exciting relevant um and really mainstream in a way that it had that it, it has never been and the way to do that is essentially by connecting it with the two things that uh once again have an impact on everyone's life um politics government and money economics um so yeah that's that's uh my ideology in a nutshell right yeah and, and, and as you were speaking there it just reminded me of perhaps one of our maybe a point of disagreement i'm not sure we could work through it uh, before the call and that was so you, you describe you know it being related to childhood as a, as a myth there is that something you believe in yeah i i think i think an absolute belief in a cause of mental illness is totally a myth um uh, you know um of course it is a contributing factor of course childhood trauma and childhood abuse um are incredibly incredibly important contributors um but i think people tend to get very unidimensional when they conceptualize mental health or mental illness and there is this and i think it's sort of comforting for us to blame one thing to to identify one concrete thing because if if you tell somebody that mental health is this jumble or this sort of uh, very complex intersectional thing i think they're going to get nervous and confused and frightened and so everybody likes to sort of just blame one thing like if only you could tell me that that sort of um, uh, evil uncle of mine is to be blamed for my maladies uh, i could feel a lot better because then i know what to blame and i think um, i think we now need to outgrow that attitude because there is enough evidence that um you know the same life events don't necessarily result in the same outcomes for different people um and 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 that is uh, you know that is because of the biochemistry that we inherit from our parents that is because of the societies in which we are born and we operate in um and so uh, my discomfort is not with you know attributing a part of your malady with to something in your childhood of course that is that is the case but let's not reduce it to just that because there is a lot more at work here right yeah that's a that's an important point and i suppose i'm somewhat biased by my own experience where because uh i i guess from an intersectional perspective i don't uh i don't suffer too too many contributing factors to any any mental health issues that i might have you know i i live in a relatively position privileged position in society um so i i guess for me the the major contributor to 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 the mental health issues that i have had has have been childhood events and actually for me specifically i believe the the birth event for me so it's uh i guess for me that's given me a very strong bias to believe from my arguably privileged position that uh yeah that is all about childhood I mean I'm I'm first of all I'm really sorry that you had to go through this this trauma I, nobody deserves that um and I mean once again um having experienced um you know I I I think uh 
um, the idea that we that 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 there exists something called a happy childhood um, has always troubled me because I, I don't remember my childhood as being particularly happy. Um, not because uh, people went out of their way to make me unhappy, um, but uh, we all experience. I think many of us experience different levels of trauma and. Um, nothing that nothing that I say here or that anybody says uh, can ever invalidate those experiences. So I think that's important to acknowledge. Um, and I think, I mean, you speak about privilege, but I mean, you know, I, I have a very uneasy relationship with, with um, uh, you know, whenever people, whenever people invoke that word, because privilege comes with its own cross, um, you know, and the fact that we are aware of our privilege that's amazing. I mean, many people walk through life without even an iota of, you know, understanding about their privilege. And the fact that we've begun to reckon with our privilege, I think, is a big step forward. But um, once again, privilege does not necessarily lessen the impact of life experiences. Um, you know, if that were if that were the case, then film stars and celebrities would be, you know, living in Wonderland all the time. And <laughs> Yeah. You know, not doing drugs or killing themselves or suffering horrible, horrible mental afflictions. So, um, so yeah, I think, and and once again, that you know, the, this discussion can go in so many different directions. And um, you know, um, I, I, I think um, the the whole idea of of childhood, the whole idea of happiness, these are all such incredibly layered and and culturally sensitive um, topics. Um, but yeah, like I said, uh, I'm really sorry. I, I just nobody, nobody deserves to go through that. Yeah, no, no thank you. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just useful to reflect and you give them, I mean, the value to me of this perspective is that, yeah, because I, I become so dominate, you know, so my, my mind has become so dominated by these specific you know, conditions, events of my early life and the work that I've done with in therapy that, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's good for me to zoom out and, consider that uh yeah those those aren't the only those aren't the only factors uh and so what so uh, i guess since you've started on this journey of understanding uh mental health in this in this very broad context what what has struck you the most as being the very powerful factors that perhaps people don't talk about or that perhaps you weren't uh as familiar with when you first came into this uh, that, that pertain to our mental health I think, um, yeah, that's a that's a very very uh, very good question. I I I'm, I haven't I haven't explicitly thought about all the different dimensions of that question, uh, but let me attempt an answer. Um, I think to me the most fascinating and definitely the most surprising journey has been um, uh, has been the journey that I have made trying to understand the language of mental health um, and and the power of language um, and you know the the. Uh, you know, uh, people who live with any kind of disability, uh, whether mental or physical um, or, you know, psychosocial, uh, they die a thousand deaths every day because of the random acts of indignity, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of random acts of unkindness uh, that people unconsciously, uh, you know, uh, uh, dish out uh, by using deeply stigmatizing um, or excluding language. Um, I'll give you an example, uh, and this is sort of tied up with my work. Uh, so, you know, uh, one of the most recurring descriptions of depression is that it is a black thing, you know, that it is dark and it is black. Uh, you will see this repeatedly in depression, depression literature um, and in first person accounts. And I was no exception. I always imagined it as a dark black thing. And um, I wrote about it in one of my earlier, one of my earliest essays. And I remember my um, my edi e managing editor Eliza reading the piece, and and telling me, "Hang on, do you want to reconsider this imagery? Because is it fair to describe everything that is vile in the world as black?" And it struck me like lightning. I was completely, I was so torn because, on the one hand, I didn't want to discredit my experience. I experienced it as a black thing, and I didn't want to lie about it to my readers. But on the other hand, I realized the tremendous trauma that people of color experience uh, and the stereotypes and, and the myths 
um, uh, you know, the vile, vile, uh, you know, lies that are spread about and, and with the indignities that black people have to suffer. And this is so relevant right now in the world that we're living in today. Um, and so I wrote about that. I, I, I wrote a sort of like an apology note for my readers saying, I'm really sorry, but I never thought about this, you know, and um, to me, uh, reading out ableism from language, reading out, um, you know, toxic vocabulary, um, you know, um, uh, uh, vocabulary that excludes people of a certain uh, uh, makeup, um, that has been definitely the most, most intriguing, the most challenging journey because it's unconscious. It seeps in uh, even without you realizing that you're doing it. You say things uh, maybe as a joke, you say things, uh, you know, maybe completely ignorantly, but it's a never ending journey and I'm just learning every day. So are you suggesting here then that people's unconscious use of language is a contributing factor to mental health? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, whether it is at a very overt, explicit level, for instance, political leaders uh, describing people of minorities as uh, vermin or pests. This has happened since the earliest days of, uh, you know, since the days of Nazism. Uh, it happens in totalitarian countries, you know, in 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 uh, all the time, and uh, or if it is, uh, you know, unconscious things like my lapse into describing depression as black, um, uh, or or for instance, uh, you know, the, the, the use of words like retard and and moron and and what have you. I mean, there's a website that actually gives an alternative list of words. You can say this instead of crazy. You can say this instead of uh, whatever moron. Um, and it makes you, uh, you, could, you could brush it all off by saying, ah, this is, it's just first world problems, um, you know, um, or, or you could really reflect and, and ask yourself, what does this choice of words do to a person who's lived with this identity all their life? Um, for you, it might just be a random turn of phrase, but for somebody who's uh, been persecuted all their life for being black or whatever, you know, or being gay or any of those things. Um, what does it do to them? What does it tell you? Um, what does it tell them about about the kind of person you are? So, yeah, it's it's a huge responsibility, especially as a journalist. Um, it's a huge responsibility. Right, uh, and so so it's definitely caused you to shift shift uh, the the language you use to reflect on the language that you use, um, yeah. and specifically then around uh, you know depression and, and anxiety. Yeah, let's focus it on that because I'm guessing a lot of people listening may have uh, experienced um, issues in those realms. What have you discovered as being major factors there, maybe for yourself uh, or for people in general with with those conditions especially? I mean, that's a trillion dollar question, I think, because uh, uh, scientists all over the world have been trying to get a grip on exactly what causes us to be depressed or anxious. And there is really no consensus on anything. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's very much a case of two steps forward, four steps backwards. Um, and uh, I mean, there are differing views. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, the mental health, uh, uh, the state mental health infrastructure in the US, for instance, have, they've, they've uh, poured in hundreds of millions of dollars in answering these questions, and there is no uh, unanimity. Uh, all we know is, um, I, I keep going back to things that I've already said, all we know is that it is, um, it is uh, amazingly intersectional. All we know is that heredity might play a role. Um, you know, um, it, this could be a genetic inheritance. Um, and, and, all, and, and we also know that uh, these things can be cured. I think that, that recovery is possible, whether completely or partially, uh, but you can live, a, 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 you know, a, a, well, I'm loath to use the word normal, but I suppose I have to say normal. Um, you can live a normal life, um, whatever that means. Um, those are the three things that, that one can say for sure. If, if anybody comes to your show and tells you a fourth or a fifth thing that they know for sure about depression or anxiety, they are bullshitting. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, um, um, and 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 I, I I suppose there is there is a fourth thing. Um, it is that you're bullshitting. Uh, 
<laughs> uh, you be the judge of that. Um, I suppose there's a fourth thing that I've learned is, is that it is an incredible community. It is the, uh, again, let me give you an example. Twitter, Twitter is such a toxic place for, uh, you know, for all practical purposes. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's full of rabid hate mongers and you know, you know, you know how it is. Yeah, how it is. Yeah. Um, but mental health Twitter, hashtag mental health Twitter is an amazing place. Um, it is, it was my window into the world of mental health. When I first in September 2017, I started maintaining a diary of my daily trysts with depression and anxiety on Twitter. It is now about 250 tweets uh, long. Um, my handle is Toy Mango if anybody wants to check it out. Um, and I started being pulled into this sort of mental health conversation by practitioners, by social workers, by, you know, um, uh, user survivors themselves. And Twitter actually did a survey in the UK, I think. Uh, I wrote a newsletter about this, which showed that the, uh, you know, the, the power of mental health Twitter, especially, um, you know, is, is a wondrous thing. People form real connections and uh, find real therapies um in in a place that is otherwise so toxic and so i think the the fourth thing that i've learned about depression and anxiety is that um the world is a better place for people who have lived with these conditions and extended um their hand to support others this is not something that happens automatically with i mean i suppose you could say that illness breeds a, a sort of sense of bonhomie and community all kinds of illnesses do that but but because I only have the uh, experience of, of, of being part of this community, I can say that this is almost a universal truth. All over the world, this community is what keeps people alive and sane more than anything else, more than, more than um, you know, uh, just the mechanical act of going for therapy every week or popping pills, all of which have their place. But I think without this community around you, it is almost impossible to 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 um, deal with it. Right, and that makes uh, yeah, that certainly resonates. That ability to find community. Uh, I mean, I remember in my early days in recovery in twelve step groups that that, that was vital for me um, to sort of stabilize and find support uh, initially when I yeah when I gave up booze and I, so I. I yeah, I completely resonate with that. Although I remember re reading a study about the yeah, effectiveness of 12-step and AA groups and I actually found that um, it, it, the levels of recidivism were similar whether you not you joined AA or a tennis club. <laughs> so actually there may be just something in joining a community that, that, that has, the, has the impact. Um, not necessarily one, you know, that's, that's directed at whatever your, your mental malady, but that power of community, I think, is yeah, really important point. Yeah, and and I think this is you know this is something that gets obscured very often in in mental health conversations because much of what uh, much of the research that happens in this in this world is rooted very specifically in in Western contexts. Um, we recently published a piece by um, uh, a lovely American author. Uh, she wrote about how the experience of uh, schizophrenia, which is by far, you know, among the most stigmatized mental illnesses, how the experience of people with schizophrenia in non-Western contexts can be so different um, from people in the West. And her hypothesis was that it is because um, in non-Western contexts, there is a very unique dynamic of community, uh, which is often missing uh, in, in Western contexts. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, she cited a lot of research. Um, but again, like, you know, research and, and experiments in, in, in psychology and psychiatry are so fraught because they're so culturally rooted. Um, you know, they're so dominated by the sort of whole weird, you know, Western um, uh, industrialized, rich, democratic, that demographic. Um, that often I think it is difficult to uh, see the full potential of something like community, which once again is very contextual, very culturally rooted. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, it's it's an incredible and and not just not just uh, 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 when I say the power of community, I don't refer to it just as you know the sort of uh, shield of people around an individual. Um, but now there is increasing evidence that community-based mental health interventions are a far superior 
uh, replacement um you know uh, for uh, you know solely relying on on western or uh, sort of traditional medicine um in 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 the state of gujarat in india there is this project called atmiyata which runs in over 600 villages which is entirely community run and community managed and these are you know villagers who are often school dropouts there are deep caste and religion boundaries but they have managed to deliver staggering results uh, you know when neighbor helps neighbor that is very elemental and very powerful right yeah it reminds me of the book yeah, johan hari his book lost connections yeah. he'd, he'd done a lot yeah. of research into it and found that uh yeah that, that the drugs had a tiny impact um but that uh the, the community once once feeling a place within community had the, the major impact yeah um that makes complete so if you village if you visited that village that sounds like a <laughs> i have i have and i met some of these mental health champions as they're called and i was i was blown away i mean sorry to use violent language by the way uh, <laughs> um okay. i didn't uh, experience having, that having, as a microaggression having pontificated about you know violent language uh, i should i should uh, i should watch my words um yeah i i did uh, visit that village um it, it was the most profound experience of my life i think um you 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 never really you can never really understand the power of um a completely untrained completely um, divorced from books and theory and freud and what have you person who's who can barely string you know um uh, a, a complete sentence in english even um uh, you know they speak in local languages they are earthy they are they have they they don't look at mental illness depression etc as clinical conditions they look at these things as existential problems that can be trouble shot you know um and again i mean i, I might i might run, i'm running the risk of romanticizing that approach because because you know it it that's not my intention um and have you know but when i went there when i went to the ground and when i met the met both the people who were doing this work and some of the i spoke to a far, farmer for instance who was suicidal because um you know he had to marry off his daughter and he didn't have enough money and he was sitting outside the local panchayat office panchayat is the local government unit in villages the local panchayat office every day trying to trying to get a loan but because he was illiterate he was not able to and he was helped by this man a young man from the same village and then he sort of he didn't know at that time that this man was also a, a mental health champion but he kind of unburdened and told him that this was his problem and then what started as a simple gesture of helping him fill a bank loan application ended up becoming something more profound and i was sitting face to face with this farmer in the room of the in the house of this mental health champion and he was telling me he had al he almost had tears in his eyes saying how he was rescued from sort of almost certain you know ruin uh by this young boy from his village and he never knew that the boy was he had seen the boy potentially many more times in the past but he never knew that he he could do this to him or for him and it was an epiphany i can tell you it was amazing right that he could now contribute in that way yes yeah that's that's extraordinary and and for you with your with anxiety and depression have you found communities yourself that you can tap into and uh, and do you consider yourself now in recovery where, where where are you yeah that's a great question um once again i i mean let me tackle the second half of that question i have been in depression well at least diagnosed as a depressive for let's see now 19 years uh 18 19 years and almost certainly i had depressive traits when i was much younger um but they were not diagnosed because you know in the late 80s early 90s growing up in india before liberalization before the economy was opened up to the rest of the world these were not even things that you you know for me depression was just a bad weather condition um you know that, that that's the only meaning of the word that i knew um then in college i i was diagnosed by a therapist and and all of that um recovery is a very slippery idea and sometimes i even question do i want to be recovered fully uh, do i want to fully recover and I, i don't think i do because um 
you know, I'm being very honest. I, I don't think I want to be recovered if recovery means going back to the earlier uh, sort of very, very naive view of the world. Um, so I think. You but know, but why, would, why, would, why would that be naive? I mean, surely not being depressed. Why, why, does it, why is not yeah. depressed necessarily yeah. naive? I don't, I don't For understand. me, it is. I mean, I, I, can, I can see the difference that this experience has made to me. It's profound. I, I don't take anything in life for granted, for one. I always assume that a person is going through shit in their life before I open my mouth. I never allow myself to fly off the handle. Uh, of course, sometimes I do, but it's most that's mostly reserved for people who are who have no, you know, they have no escape. They are stuck in my life. Um, um, I have become a lot more thoughtful, a lot more considerate, a lot more, I think, human. Um, and I, again, I don't, I don't mean to romanticize depression. I recently wrote a piece about this. Funny because you, you know, you brought up something that I was recently kicked in the butt for. Um, I wrote a piece about anxiety in the context of the pandemic. And I basically said that we've completely messed up our relationship with anxiety because anxiety was supposed to be an evolutionary response to danger. And now we have, we have pathologized anxiety so much that we rebel against it and we are constantly trying to fight it. And we've completely messed up that very, very raw, very primal relationship that we had with anxiety. And so you have these guys partying uh, in the beach, on the beaches of Miami in the middle of a global pandemic or going to nightclubs in Berlin, uh, showing the middle finger to the virus as if the virus even cares. Uh, so this sort of revolt against, no, we are not going to cave in, we are not going to show any signs of vulnerability and anxiety has led to tremendous problems uh, you know, for the world. Uh, so, so in that context, I say that if, if, if recovery means that all of this, and I, I see them as superpowers really, that all of this is going to be taken away from me. I don't want to recover. Of course, I don't want to feel like shit um, every day. But I have realized after living with depression for 18, 20 years, I've realized that it's a package deal, you know. Um, and, and so this is, this is I've, I've tweeted about this many times. The depression is sort of like a perverse luxury. It's sort of like you're walking around with a do not disturb border on, on your neck. You know, and if, you, if you're open about it and if you've told the whole world that you are depressed, it liberates you. You don't have to be correct all the time. So it is, it is a very disturbing feeling sometimes because you're like, this is not good and I should completely get rid of it. But at the same time, I realize that I have, I have gotten so much out of this experience. Um, if, I, if I had a chance to do my life all over again, would I be very bitter and resentful about this experience? I don't wish this on anyone. I don't wish my child gets it from me. I don't wish you have to go through it or anybody else. But in my life, look, I, I, I can just be honest about my life and I can say that it has given me so much. Uh, it has also taken away so much from me, but it has given me so much, probably because of my privilege, probably because I had access to great care, that I have a fantastic therapist, that I have a supporting wife, that I have a tremendous job, um, but I think it has shaped my relationship with the world in a way that was impossible 10 years ago, 15 years ago for me to even imagine. Um, so yeah, that was the context. Yeah, but I, but, but I still, I still, I'm st I still can't get my head around it because you could recover and you still wouldn't necessarily be naive because you'd have all of this experience that then you could take into the world and empathize with others and so on. I don't know. I, I can understand if you'd never had it at all why well, you might be by, by, but if you yeah. were now to recover, I, I, I mean, you know, like I said, I, if recovery, if recovery merely means that I can feel a little less weight on my chest every morning when I wake up, and I can see the light a little more, and all of those sort of, you know, all the imagery that you generally associate with depression, all of that, or many of those things are true for me as well. And if recovery only means that, but I have seen that, you know, like. And like I said, I because I, I perhaps I, I don't remember a day in my life that I haven't been depressed. So it's impossible for me to imagine what that might feel like. Um, and I'm scared. I'm scared because I feel because I don't know uh, what that world might look like. It is almost like you get so used to living with this beast inside of you. Um, I don't know what what do they call it? Stockholm syndrome? Is, isn't that what they call it? <laughs> 
Um, uh, you know, so so uh, I, I take your point. Theoretically, it is possible to be recovered and it and to retain all of this. Um, yeah, maybe I'll think about it. I I I am I'm, I'm afraid. Like I said, I I I feel as if um, you know the, the the way in which um, some some healers, some psychiatrists, for instance. Uh, describe recovery from depression. And here I'm, again, entering very, very contentious territory. Um, as if it is the same thing as slicing off a tumor from your body, which, which it isn't. As if it's a finite thing, as if recovery is a finite thing. Like you are depressed and then you are not. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know, but I, don't, I haven't met a single depressed a person with depression who has had that experience of recovery? It's always a loopy, circular process. You you go forward, then you then you recede, and you you wrestle with it for your for 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 a lifetime, and it ends up depleting you and exhausting you, and you know it it is the most horrible thing to live with. Um, I wish there were. I, I I don't know. Can you retain the unique sense of humanity that depression gifts you? while surgically slicing off everything else? Is it possible? I don't know. I don't know. Right. Yeah. And I guess, again, I'm very much swayed by my own experience of what i All I've of us are. To... All of us are. I, like I said, I'm, I'm completely biased by my experiences. So. Yeah, but I completely relate to that fear. I remember when I first g gave up alcohol and I was just terrified of what my identity would be because I'd been the, the, the hard-drinking guy with the drinking stories. Go. And, and I was like, what the fuck am I going to, you know, what am I, who am I going to be without this? Like, and I can, I, yeah, I shed a lot of tears, like ha, about who, who, what, yeah, how my identity was going to shift. I remember like, what am I going to become like a rambler? Like, am I going to start taking, you know, what on earth, who on earth am I going to be? And it really, uh, it really shook me. And, it, and as other addictions has fallen away over the years, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I've continued to face that fear. Um, but I suppose my experience having feel like I'm making great leaps in my recovery is that um yeah, I don't miss it. I don't miss that for a second. I don't miss any yeah. of those addictive patterns for a second. And I don't feel I've lost any of my ability to empathize with those who've got them or understand the world through that. It's like I that it hasn't my that experience is still is still with me in terms of what it's the gift it's given me. Uh, and connecting to others with 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 similar issues. That's 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 what I feel. So that's that's I guess why I was a bit thrown by. The... That's very heartening. That's very heartening. I'm taking a lot away from this conversation because it always helps. I mean, yeah, we are all blinkered um, in our own ways, and you know, um, I'll, I'll certainly think about this. Intuitively, I feel I know you're right, um, but there is this tremendous fear. I think you've nailed it when you said. It becomes so intertwined with your identity that you sort of ask yourself, like in my case, you can imagine, I now have, I've turned around my life and my career in this direction because I had lived experience. And you've got to ask yourself, if you don't have this, will, will people listen to you? Um, right. What is your worth going to be if you don't have this? What will make you different? And that's an elemental fear. And I, I've never been... I've, I've always been open about this being a very selfish, very, very selfish uh, feeling. Um, if, if you are part of a society where talking about your inner life is taboo and you fought everybody and everything to claim that space for yourself, you don't want to give it up. Right. No, I, I can get that. I, I, can, I can get that. But yeah. I, I think you could recover and you, would, you, you could still have this conversation with absolute authority. Uh, yeah. You could. Thank you. <laughs> but you know, this isn't supposed to be about me giving you advice. Uh, um, yes. Uh, but, but, I, but I do think it speaks to a, a wider concern I have about um, the romanticization and the over pathologizing yeah. of these conditions and people, be it does become so central to their identity that they, almost forget that there is a route out of it you know it's possible to recover yeah. it's possible to do deep therapy it's possible to 
work on yourself and 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 make things different build community around you you know look at these intersectional factors and make shifts um in order that what you experience around you changes so so all of this is possible um so uh, so yeah it's a double edged sword because it's becoming a more public conversation it's becoming less taboo to talk about yeah yeah absolutely um i mean um I, I, I think the, the the bit about romanticization, uh, you know, it always gives me pause because it sounds to me like I mean I used to, you know, like when I first started publicly talking about uh, my condition, and a lot of people came to me with you know words like you're very brave and you're you're doing this is so incredibly um, inspiring and things like that. Um, at first, you don't take all that too seriously because you're like. What you guys don't know is that I'm doing it for my own therapy. I'm not doing it for you. Um, but then after a while, you you know when these messages keep pouring in, you 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 sort of sort of start looking at yourself like a bit of a hero. I, I you know I can't lie about that. And you're like, okay, you're doing something that the average Joe can't, and that makes you special in some way. And then it sort of hits you that what you're boasting about yourself is a horrible affliction that kills millions of people. And it's really not something to 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 boast about. But then, um, and then you know, you read in the papers these days that it's sort of become like cool and fashionable. Everybody seems to have a diagnosis of depression. And my question is, so what? Like, why do you care that somebody else also has a diagnosis of depression? I basically feel that for centuries people have been stopped from talking about their inner lives, and I'm all for people talking about it, even if they exaggerate it. It doesn't concern me. I am all for people being given the agency to shout from the rooftops that they're depressed. Um, of course, you know, if they have access to training, hopefully they will see that the word depression clinically means something else. But I am not for at all for appropriating the experience of depression only for people who have the diagnosis of depression. Um, and it, I feel that there is so much latent angst in people around the world. There is so much that is choking up our humanity. Let it all out. Let it all out. For the next 20 years, let's everybody come together and scream that we are unhappy and sad and depressed. You know, yeah. to me, there is no greater political act. There is no greater act of rebellion than to just be yourself and claim space for yourself to be sad and to be depressed and to be ravaged and to announce it to the world, you know? Um, so at the same time, I don't want everybody to feel pressured to do it. It is a choice. You want to do it, do it. You don't want to do it. It's nobody's business to tell you that you should do it because it's the brave thing to do. It, there's, I, 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 with all, you know, so many of my friends in the mental health ecosystem, I hate that word ecosystem. It's a legacy from my days as a business journalist when I used to cover startups in Silicon Valley. Um, so many of my friends were in this, in this uh, community. Um, I, I dream of a day when we don't have to call this uh, act of having a conversation about your inner life brave anymore. What is brave about this? Um, so if, room, if, if, if overexposure to people's pain is what the world needs, let's give it to, let's give it to them. Right. That's a, yeah, it feels like a revolutionary start almost. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, yeah and let's, and let's, I'd like actually to go back to the, the, the reason that you, you became known to me. And that was, that was your article uh, yes. from the myth of meritocracy to the rise of bullshit jobs. And I think these intersect, right? So your sort of critique of, of workplace culture and how that overlaps with the, the mental health issues that we have. So could you, yeah, expand on that intersection a little? Absolutely. I mean, work, I think the, I, the modern idea of work, or as, as we understand the word work, is probably the, it's probably right up there when it comes to the sort of list of things that drive people to insanity and I mean, you know, it, uh, whether it is, whether it manifests pathologically or not. Um, and I, I was always troubled by this uh, idea of workplace happiness and that's where it all sort of began. Um, again, I was a, I was a, 
uh, you know, I used to work for, for Fortune, uh, Fortune magazines, Indian edition, and I used to cover startups. And, you know, everybody was inspired by Google's office canteens and bean bags and what have you, and bring your pet to work day and, you know, whatever other mousetrap you can think of. <laughs> and I was like, what are these guys talking? And the chief happiness officer, I mean, what was that? And I was like, what is this idea of workplace happiness? Can work make people happy? Really? I grew up in a family where my father used to work in a steel plant. My mother was a nurse for, for 40 years of their lives. They never missed a day of work. They were very grateful for the work that they did, which was brutal, physical. Um, they never told me that they were ecstatic because they were doing this job. Oh my God, I, I was so happy at work today. It was, these are completely incompatible ideas. They have nothing, and that's not a judgment on work. It is, what is happiness even? Like, for such a shifty idea that philosophers and psychologists for centuries haven't been able to agree on whether happiness is even real. I mean, if you go by some, some uh, psychologists, uh, psychologists and philosophers, they'll tell you that happiness is a, is a real evolutionary disincentive because it makes you, it, it forces you to put your guard down and then you are vulnerable to attacks. Um, and sadness, on the other hand, is a real function. Uh, I mean, I always say that happiness is a bit like, an, a bit, bit like the appendix. You generally don't notice it, but when you do notice it, it probably means you're in for a lot of pain. Um, you know, and so I started wondering what the hell is this idea of workplace happiness? And then I discovered that, hang on a second, the reason why people are unhappy about the work that they're doing is because they are being driven up the wall to increase their productivity and their efficiency. And then these companies decided that let's give them these sort of perks like, Yay, Friday beer on the company. Um, why? Why were they doing all this? Because they wanted their employees to be more productive. And I realized what a big scam this is. You know, it's a, it's a gigantic con. Um, it is productivity obsession that makes people unhappy. So let's make them happy so that they can be more productive. It's an obnoxious, obnoxious idea. And so that's where I started thinking. And I had this chat with my editors, Rob and Eliza. And I was like, listen, I, I got to write about this. And they said, OK, so if happiness is not a viable option, then what is it that, that work should do for us, apart from paying our bills? And I said, humanity. Humanity is a worthy goal. And humanity is not happiness. Humanity is a much more concrete, a much more achievable outcome. And so in that article, I, I proposed seven things that companies can do, such, such as eschewing the language of war. Don't fight the war for talent, because it's the war for talent that makes you invest in these silly ideas, uh, like free smoothies and, and avocado on toast. Um, don't, uh, you know, take... Well, don't don't knock the... avocado on toast, Tim. I'm sorry. <laughs> don't knock avocado. One of my favorite snacks. <laughs> oh... Yeah, sorry, nothing, nothing personal against avocado. I think it's a wonderful uh, thing. Uh, I'm not even sure if it's a fruit or a vegetable, which is why I said thing. Um, but, um, you know, don't use the language of war. Um, invest in the future of work, which is digital. I mean, don't treat the Uber drivers and the food delivery partners that, that deliver food at your doorstep as sort of, sort of incidental, as collateral damage to your business plans. Um, so I came up with seven of these suggestions and I was, I was amazed by the response this piece generated. I was so humbled and so amazed. Recently, we translated this piece into Dutch because our Dutch members wanted it. And my notifications on Twitter haven't stopped uh, humming. So um, yeah, I was, I was very grateful. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. To, you know, and, and even from a philosophical perspective, you know, it, it, my reading of some of the ancient philosophy around happiness is that you don't don't aim for happiness, aim for virtue. And and happiness will emerge from time to time and we can enjoy it when it pops up. But uh, aim in life for virtue and then you're, you're more likely to experience happiness more often. And that seems to me to be concordant with that idea. Yeah, I mean, and once again, this idea of virtue has to be practiced by everybody. What happens in the workplace is that this idea of virtue is generally practiced by the minions on the shop floor, not by those guys who sit in the boardroom 
um, and discuss ways to increase their salaries in the middle of the worst humanitarian crisis in in in, in decades. You know, as it happened with with uh, certain companies in the West that I cannot name right now. Um, so, again, uh, you know, in the in the workplace, everything is just so. Uh, and the, the the idea of meritocracy in particular, which was part of the headline that you that you read, um, or the story that you read, this idea of meritocracy is 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 premised on there being a level playing field, and then supply if you if you supplement that with meritocracy, only the best will rise. So it's a fair system, but that's just that's so much hot air. What is meritocracy? What is level playing field? Um, success is basically a combination of inheritance and dumb luck. That's all that there is for, for the vast majority of successful people in the world. There is no such thing as a self-made billionaire. There is no such thing. And we are, we are actually working on a series on that on the correspondence, so not so subtle plug. But what about the, vir the virtue of hard work? Does that not play any role? No, again, it's a con. I mean, what is, who's, who, whose idea is this that hard work is, is a virtue? I mean, John Stuart Mill said something like that, I think, and a lot of other people before and after him. But again, this is just such, a, such an obnoxious, basically, um, you know, I, I read this, I read this, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of this British uh, uh, a sociologist, tremendously talented person who actually died by suicide, very tragic. Um, uh, Mark, I'm forgetting the name. Um, um, he he uh, he wrote this incredible piece, um, um, you know, about uh, self care, about the idea of self care, and he said, you know, like, which is which is such a booming hashtag on Instagram and and Twitter and social media, right? Everything from nail painting to throwing axes. Um, everything goes as self-care. And he basically said that self-care is like this little lollipop that, that they dangle in front of you because they want you to work very hard. You know, and then they say, okay, here are some dollars. Now go and buy yourself some uh, massage oil or whatever, or an axe. Yeah, just don't throw it at us. That sounds fun, actually. So <laughs> it is, it is, I, you know, uh, but I, I wish I didn't have to, I, I wish I didn't have to be subservient to another person's idea of how hard I need to work. And again, that, that ties up with this, with, with the current zeitgeist and, you know, this sort of clamor for universal income, you know, uh, my colleague Rusika Bregman is, is sort of the global authority on this. Um, and he says, you know, the, perhaps one day there will be, uh, there will be sort of a future where we don't have to lift a finger to to get money for our sustenance, and I think I think you know it, it, the idea of UBI has assumed so much momentum right now, um, because people have seen through this sort of charade that you know this sort of scam that was perpetuated on them, saying work hard and harder and harder and harder, and the harder you work, it's sort of like crossing levels in a video game, you know, um, and and you know you get paid a little more, and then you get a fancier title, and then you get the corner office. Mind you, I don't have the solution for that. I'm a journalist. My prob my job is to point out problems, but I, but because the correspondent, we also we try to be constructive, which is why in that piece I said, hopefully if we follow these seven things. But you know, it's we are so interdependent. Everybody then has to follow those seven things. If one company decides no, you know, we are not going to, and they employ three million people, then this is going to fall flat. So it's a utopian idea right now that there can be a future where this sort of idea of hard work and self-care and then free perks, all of these things will become totally irrelevant, but not, no revolution, no change ever started by aiming easy, right? Right, but you've, you've, you've covered a couple of ideas there. So you've, you've universal basic insight and I suppose increase, increasing virtuousness in the workplace. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit lost as to how those relate. Are you... Are you yeah, suggesting so, we should all have UBI give up work, or are you suggesting we should make our workplaces more humane? Or, or I, I definitely, I, I think the, I think the, the ideal uh, situation would be that all of us are given, everybody, everybody is given money, free money. Uh, I'm all for that idea, and I know that there are incredible uh, opponents to that idea also. That people will just become lazy and indolent, and it will ruin our economies and what have you. There is enough research arguing both for and against, but. But very elementally, I totally wish for that world. Um, 
but that said, I'm also very aware that it's not going to happen tomorrow. We are stuck with this paradigm of work for the near future. And so it is incumbent on us to try and make that a little better while it lasts. And who knows, we may not hate it so much by the end of it. Um, and so not everybody in the world might, might opt in for basic income when it, when it comes. And that might reduce the strain on the economy and the government and the exchequer and all of that. So it's, but, but so essentially the idea is make work better while we still have to work for a living, but aim for a basic income eventually. Right. But even with a basic income, people will be free to work, right? It's not like... Yeah, of course. Absolutely. <clears throat> exactly. And that's something that people often confuse, you know, as if like it is universal basic income will come with a mandate that you have to now sit on your ass all day. Right. It's, that's, that's not the case. Okay, yeah. It's, uh, it's no strings attached. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um... And so of the of the seven the seven virtues of the workplace, let's say, uh, were there were there any others you'd, you'd pick out uh, to share right now? Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that really, um, you know, again in the context of lockdown and the sort of pandemic, um, and what's happening in my country and my neighborhood, um, I realized that, you know, we always crib about our employers and our organizations, but we don't we don't remember a simple fact that we are also employers of other people. Um, you know, there's a person who comes and, you know, cooks for us. There's a person who comes and helps us with household chores. There is somebody who cleans the car. And because, you know, these are luxuries that people in India, the middle class, uh, and the rich people in India, people of privilege can afford. But we often forget that we are employers too. And the exact same things that we hate um, when our employers do it to us, we perpetuate absolutely unthinkingly on the people who work for us. Um, so when the lockdown started, they said, we are not going to the, the apartment complex. This was the management. They came together and said, you know, obviously we can't allow people to come into the building anymore. So, you know, your cooks and your household help, they, they wouldn't be able to come from tomorrow or from next week or whatever. And almost immediately, several people stopped paying them salaries, you know, and it struck me as such an such a such a i don't even know i'm running out of uh, you know adjectives i i feel like and, and then this, these these same people will shout cry themselves hoarse when a company fires them without giving them severance mm. you know so one of the seven principles was let's try and take responsibility for our stuff also you know let's recognize that we are all employers and there are various service, service providers that depend on us and let's look at how we treat them. And maybe then it'll sort of help us put things in perspective a little bit and cooperate a little more with each other. Um, so that was one that stood out. And another one I think, um, uh, you know, was this sort of idea that um, none of this change is possible unless we empower, unless we create safe spaces where people can have radically honest dialogue. And I'm always I'm reminded of this story, which I cited in my piece also about this fintech company called Gravity, um, and it's and it's uh, uh, founder uh, uh, Dan Price. It's a it, by by now that story is legendary. But essentially, Dan Price was running this company. He was very successful. He was young, and he thought he was doing absolutely the best he could for his employees. And then one day he was on a cigarette break, and one of his employees came and basically told him that he was getting rich off of them, and that you know like. This guy sort of went into a you know, full-blown soul-searching exercise. And then he sold all his assets. He increased everybody's minimum pay to 70 grand a year. He took a huge pay cut. And of course, he was, he was called a lunatic and a communist and all of that. And five years on, the BBC did a story saying the company was doing better than ever. Um, but when they asked Dan Price what were the parameters that he was most proud of, he said, well, earlier, only so many people in my team could have babies because they couldn't afford it. The rest couldn't afford it. But now that number has gone up. Earlier, only so many people could afford a home in London. And now that number has gone up. And those, to me, are the real success stories. And so yeah. that kind fact, of... They also clubbed together and bought him a Tesla, right? Did you read that point? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They, they, they came together because the boss refused to buy a good car. Um, so, yeah. So... Uh, you know, that's a, I, I hold that story very dearly. Um, 
and I, I think it is an extremely good example of what enlightened ca- capitalism can achieve. So I'm not, yeah. a, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a sort of a, you know, I, I mean, I, I would like to have some good qualities of, of socialists, but I'm not one. Uh, I am an out-and-out capitalist, and I, I believe in consumerism, and I believe that it can actually do a lot of good. But we've we fucked it up completely, and now we need to, you know, sort of retrace our steps. Right. Yeah. It's, it, that's uh, very familiar. I had uh, Raj Sasodia, who wrote the book Conscious Capitalism, and uh, and recently the Healing Organization on the show. Yes. Yeah, he makes exactly that point. Um, yeah, and I, I love the way he frames it as bringing together masculine and feminine energy into the the way that we lead organizations, so that we have this desire to nurture and look after and care for but also keep the, the sort of masculine goal orientation and you know uh a, a bit objective um will i suppose to uh, manipulate our material world yeah yeah i, mean, I, yeah, I, I i'm not sure I, i'll have to read the book for myself but from what i'm hearing i'm, I'm already I'm, i already have a couple of problems with those binaries but but i i understand i i think well, I don't know whether we need the masculine bit at all, actually, if, if, if that is how we define masculinity, because I can, I can tell you that. Either that's um, my definition by what I don't his, but. Yeah. Oh, okay, 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 all right. But that's all right. I mean, I, I, you know, like my industry is a classic example of, of an industry that is populated by uber macho masculine people who, sees, uh, who see, um, uh, you know, uh, crying at work as a weakness and basically will never admit that they're dying inside um and uh you know it's it's a, it's an industry that is rife with uh mental distress but nobody talks about it because it's it is just unmanly to do so the sort of archetypal hardened hack you know absolutely you the cigarette, to eat, right totally totally it is it's sort of the um you know uh, you're supposed to be like paul avery in, in zodiac um uh, don't talk about your feelings, just become an alcoholic and die. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, which is pretty much the track I was on, actually, if I think about it before I am. Um, I'm sorry, that was not, know. that was not, no, no, but, your no, no, but it, it, it's funny. It's Maybe like that, hundred years. <laughs> some, some kind of trajectory that you, and you do break it by starting to feel feelings. That's absolutely how you, how yeah. you, how you break that trajectory. That's where it all starts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Wow. Well, we've been going an hour. It's been um, it's been a it's been a fantastic conversation, uh, Tad Moy. I think we could probably go another hour if we chose to, but um, you know, it feels like we've um, we've done service to the couple of major topics that are both close to my heart, at least uh, you know, mental health and and the workplace or work workplace culture. So good. Um, and for people who want to get more of your writing and thinking, um, they should head to the correspondent, right? Or tell tell them where to go. Yeah, you can find me on the correspondent and and uh, several of my incredible fellow writers from around the world uh, on the correspondent.com. Uh, we don't have essentially you can become a member by paying what you would like to, um, and then you can find me on on Twitter. My handle is Toy Mango um, on LinkedIn. Um, where I am by my name, um, and I hope to see you there. Yes, that's wonderful. And I should say for people who want to join the correspondent, I love the model. Right, you can pay as as little as a dollar a dollar a month. You can pay as much as you as you like. There's no ads, and you have this sort of slow news because I'm I'm currently yeah. valiantly trying to drop my news addiction, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think this kind of more reflective. Uh, uh yeah it's a style of sort of writing about the world it, it's certainly i find, find appealing thank you yes we are our, our motto is actually i'm breaking news so if you uh go to our home page you may not even realize that this is it's 2020 oh, i mean to be honest it probably it, it is there are enough stories that are very relevant in the here, here and now but we, we are not led by the news cycle well oh, no it's it's great Okay, well, thank you once again. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks <laughs> so much. All right. I, I, I love talking to you. Thank you. And thanks thank everybody you. for listening. Thank you. Thank you.